Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with a faith stretching top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss any of our future videos. Today's topic, 10 characteristics of a radically biblical church. The only perfect elders are in heaven. The perfect church won't occur until the very second the trumpet blows and we see Christ face to face. But shouldn't we want to align our church practice and beliefs as closely as we can to Christ's desires for her? Or dare we be radically biblical? Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. He deserves it his way. Let's think about this. So, number one. Are we Christ-pleasing or congregation-pleasing? The name of the church that comes to attention in the first century, Laodicea, means the voice of the people. And the idea that the people decide the kind of church they want, they go church shopping, and there are all sorts of surveys taken to see what kind of church would you like to attend. It's not our church. It's not the pastor's church, the elder's church. It's Christ's church. He's the one who died for it, and he deserves to decide what it looks like. If I came to stay at your house, and uh, you said you're welcome to stay, and I said, well, yeah, this is a lovely house here. I just don't like that half wall there between your dining room and living room, but it's okay, I've got a 10-pound sledgehammer in my suitcase and I'll look after it for you. You see, now wait a minute. We're glad to have you here, but this is our house. We paid the mortgage on this place and we kind of like the wall there. So if we want to be happy, why don't you just leave it in your suitcase? It's no right of mine to rearrange the church the way I like it. And so the whole thrust of the church should be what pleases Christ. And the Lord's Supper is a great example of that. This is the only one at which we gather only for him. And it's one of the least attended meetings in the churches. And why is that? Well, because it's not something that we particularly care about. It doesn't meet our needs. And so we need to completely change our way of thinking here. And our question should always be, what would please the Lord? And then we will be a Christ-pleasing church. Number two. Is there a spiritual focus or temporal distractions? You know, they say that a ship in the water is fine. It's when the water gets into the ship that's the problem. And the church is in the world. The problem is when the world gets into the church. And so the church ought to be driven by the will of God, not by the American dream. Somehow we've been fooled into thinking that what the American dream is, is some sort of exalted, purposeful intention of God for his people, but it isn't. And so determining what his will is, it will be manifested in the times of prayer, in the kinds of preaching, in funding priorities, how we spend our money, how we spend our time, will manifest whether we are focused on the will of God and doing that which is spiritual, or if we've slipped into the ways of the world and using human promotion, we see this, that in the Old Testament they were not allowed, not only false idols, false gods, they weren't allowed strange fire and strange incense. The idea that we artificially stimulate the crowd to worship instead of having a spiritual worship where the Holy Spirit of God draws out worship that's a dangerous thing. And so strange idols, strange incense, strange fire, these were things that were forbidden by God. And sometimes there's the danger that we allow the world to formulate and drive the way of thinking of the church rather than being spiritual. Number three, are we cooperative or are we competitive when it comes to other believers in town? Well, 
Um, I think it's important for us to realize that God wants us to be selfless in our service. And one of the things we found hugely helpful living in town here, you know, there are people who when they marry, they actually don't marry the person at the altar, they marry an ideal. And so every day they compare the person that they actually married with the ideal and their partner always disappoints them. There are other people who say, you know, I'm just a poor sinner, so anything that comes my way, any kindness, any smile, any expression of thanks, it'll make a happy day for me. And so when we meet with God's people, we meet them on the street, at the market, if we give them the impression that we're right and they're wrong, and uh, we begin to speak with them in this way and perhaps criticize or promote our church and how we do things, it doesn't build long-term relationships. We should not be saying, this is how everybody else does it, but this is how we do it. Rather, we should say, this is how God's Word gives it, and this is how we, in much weakness, are seeking to be obedient to God. But we have a long way to go. So if when I meet God's people, what characterized the Lord Jesus? A smoking flax he didn't quench. So if the Lord saw any evidence of faith, any stirring of desire, he would fan it into flame. And so when I meet another Christian, I want to find out, do they have an interest in the Word of God, in evangelism? Do they love the Lord? What ministry are they involved in? Then I want to fan that into flame. I want to encourage them in that area. And you know, every time I meet with God's people then, it's positive and it's mutually beneficial. So we understand personal selflessness. I ought to care for others even if nothing comes back to me. But we don't always think of corporate selflessness. I want to see the well-being of all of God's people enhanced. Whether they ever come to my church or benefit me, I'm just happy to see that happen. I love the words that are used of Mordecai in the Old Testament. That it says he was well received by the multitude of his brethren, seeking the good of his people and speaking peace to his countrymen. Wouldn't that be a beautiful epitaph to have at the end of your life? That you were well received by the multitude of your brethren, seeking the good of all God's people and speaking peace to our countrymen. That's Esther 10 verse 3. Number four. Are there participants or attendants? The Spirit of God wants the whole body active. The church is not supposed to be a spectator sport. When you put a few people with a microphone at the front to sing, the assumption is these are the people that are supposed to be heard. These are the people who know how to sing. And so you will see if that sort of approach actually stimulated the singing and the worship of God's people, well, so be it. But what I see very often is that people actually don't much participate in the singing because either they can't hear themselves or because the people up there are obviously the ones who are supposed to sing. The church is not supposed to be a spectator sport. We are all supposed to be speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. And then, of course, if you give one man the title of his gift and say, this is the pastor, the assumption is that the rest of us don't have a gift. We don't say that's giver George and that's helper Mary. It's just Pastor Joe. And so the assumption is he's the only professional Christian around here. We all just kind of chip in where we can. Instead of realizing there are no vestigial organs in the body, Every organ in the body is essential to the well-being of the body. And that's how God wants the body to function. Not the whole body atrophying while the tongue develops, but spirit-led body activity where we're all ministering to one another and therefore all growing up together. And that's the point in Ephesians 4 that the pastor and the teacher and the evangelist are to equip the saints so the saints can do the work of the ministry. So the whole body is growing. They're not there just to hear a few professionals. They're there to learn how we can all participate in growing together. Number five, 
Is it organic or mechanic? The less exercise, the more organize. Personal exercise, the biblical word exercise is the word gumnazo, like our gymnasium, to strip down, to mean business, to get involved. And so if I'm personally exercised by God, I'm working for him. But what often happens is the church sets up some hierarchical structure and you're not working for God. You've got a superintendent who answers to somebody else, to this committee and so on, and you're a conscript. And so you don't feel that sense, the hand of God is upon me and I'm doing this for him. And so what we see very often, the church will have a hospitality committee and so on. What ought to happen is that any visitor to our local fellowship should have to fight their way out the door past half a dozen invitations. We shouldn't have to conscript people to do this. And this is what I mean, organic versus mechanic. You don't have to tell a sheep that it has to have four legs and two ears and a nose and wool. It's organically in the sheep to do that. And the life of the church should manifest itself by personal exercise, not by imposing an organizational structure. Then number six, family model versus business model. The elders are supposed to be treated like fathers, not like executives meeting in a boardroom. And it's important to notice that elders are not a decision-making body. They're a discerning body. They're not there to make up their own minds. Otherwise, you would pick executives. You'd pick smart people who've been successful in business. But God is not looking for that. I mean, they may be businessmen, but that's not their qualification. Their qualification is that they're spiritual men. They know the Word of God, and they know how to discern the mind of God. So they're not a decision-making body, they're a discerning body. They're there to find out what does the Lord want, and then by their example to lead us just the way fathers would lead their children. If we have a group of people who look to fathers, it's a very different environment. There's love and trust and openness as opposed to having a hierarchical structure where you have a board who make decisions for the people rather than the people being exercised listening to the fathers and praying for the fathers as they seek the mind of the Lord. Along that same topic, we have number seven, multiple shepherds among the flock versus one pastor over the flock. The word for elders is always used in the plural. And uh, although it is true that in the early days of the church, Paul would have younger men like Timothy and Titus along with him who had pastoral gift, their idea was that as the evangelist saw people saved, one of these young men who was working with him in the gospel would then stay behind and help develop the saints so that they would see recognizable elders. They would point them out, say, these men are your guides. They would pack their bags and move on. So a pastor is a duplicate, a pro tem elder. If you have a pastor and elders, you're really redundant. So the pastor was there until the elders developed. Now, Paul, the most he stayed anywhere at one time was two years in Ephesus, started with raw pagans and left functioning elders. So this is not a 50-year plan where you take young people and by the time they're 60 or so, they can finally make it to the elders group. This was a process in which they were ahead of the others, but not necessarily old people. And so when we think about the development of elders, we recognize that not every elder has the same gift or the same strength. Some elders will be better working with young people, some in marriage counseling with young couples, some helping the seniors, some will have a more visitation gift, and some will have a more public teaching gift. But they all have to be able to explain the Word of God, whether privately or publicly. So when we have a group of elders, we have the strength of numbers. We have a variety. They share the burden. I read these leadership magazines. They're full of men 
having breakdowns, moral breakdowns, physical breakdowns, mental breakdown, because we've put a one-ton load on a quarter-ton truck. No elder, no one man should be expected to meet the needs of a local church. It's not designed that way. And as I say, they're not to be over the flock, they're to be among the flock. So we need church leadership, but what we should have, instead of having the pyramid model, we should lay it on its side. We have guides who lead us, but they're among us. There's one Lord and you're all brothers. There is no idea of clergy laity in the Bible. And then number eight, servant followship versus executive leadership. A lot of talk about leadership these days in the church and leadership skills and seminars and so on. And uh, no doubt there's some benefit to that. But when we look at the emphasis in the scripture, it's not on leadership, it's on followship. Follow me as I follow Christ. Whose faith follow, considering the end of their lifestyle. So the idea is that if I'm following the Lord and you're following me, then I'll be leading you in the direction of the Lord. If I veer off the path, then you need to have the courage to go on straight with Christ. But it's like two sights of a rifle. It's a lot easier to line something up. When Christ has given us spiritual leaders who are more mature, and I can line up their life with Christ, I can see them right in front of me, and they can help me in following on to know the Lord. So we don't follow people in the area of their failures or their foibles. You wouldn't follow Moses the way he got along with his wife or David the way he raised his boys. But there were areas in which they were faithful that they could be good examples. And so the same is true. Our elders aren't perfect, but in the measure in which they're faithful, we say, I like where you're going in that area and I want to follow you. We need to pray for them, we need to encourage them, but they should be guides to us because they're following the Lord, not because they've learned leadership skills. Then number nine, 50 and reproduction versus 5,000 and suppression. Yeah, maybe that's a little hard, but when the Lord Jesus fed the multitude, he said, make them sit down in 50s and 100s. He thought those were manageable numbers. It's not bad. It's a good thing for God's people to get together in large numbers. Conferences were God's idea. And three times a year, he had Israel come together. And the early church gathered on the, on the temple steps to meet. That's a good thing to do, to have a conference. But it's not the kind of thing where we can care for one another in any reasonable way. People get lost in the shuffle. And you've heard stories about this. A young gang member who put his trust in the Lord and joined a megachurch in California, but a short time later he decided to quit because he said, my gang showed me more concern than your church did. I thought I had found my family now. But that's not how it worked out. So if you have 50 people in a local church, you have 35 vitally involved. They'll have to be or the church won't survive. If you have 150 people, you'll have 35 vitally involved. You know, I look like I do because I eat like a farmer, but I don't work like a farmer. When you pass the optimum, you don't get an extra set of kidneys or a backup heart. You just get blubber. And what happens is once the key ministries are taken in a local church, the people who come along, they just veg. They become pew sitters. And so what God wants us to do is to not only reproduce lives, but to reproduce churches. And in the early days of the church, they didn't have big cathedrals. They didn't have functioning buildings. They were meeting in storefronts and homes and fields and barns, wherever they could. They had this rapid deployment skill. They could quickly move to new areas. They could react to shifts when they were driven out of Jerusalem under persecution. They took the gospel with them, and before long, there were churches all over the world. That's what God wants to see. In that case, everybody is vitally involved. So the more people you have, the more tendency you have to people having a token job, but they can't have an essential job that will cause them to 
be cast on God, to grow, to grow strong in faith, and to actually fulfill the purpose that God designed them for. So I think the Lord designed the church for total commitment. Total commitment equals total blessing. But the mega church is designed for token commitment. It's like a country club. I can stop in or not. The service is handled. We pay people to clear the tables and do everything. So it doesn't matter whether I go to the beach this week or show up at the church. That is not God's design. He wants us to understand this is body life. We need one another. We need to work together. And so I'm not saying 50 is a magic number, but I am just saying that it becomes quickly obvious when people start to be attracted to a church, not to give, but to get. And pretty soon they atrophy. That's why we have so many spiritual problems in the church. As they say, if you're rowing, you have no time to rock the boat. And when you're serving the Lord, it helps keep you out of trouble. And we need more opportunities to serve. Not organizationally, but in personal exercise, God has called me to do this work. And then finally, number 10, are we truly evangelistic or merely evangelical? So it's not just a matter of believing the gospel, it's actually living the gospel and doing the gospel, preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel. So many churches claim to be evangelical. They say we believe the gospel and they have the statement of faith. So that faith now is a statement where you check the boxes. Whereas in the early church, faith was something very different. Faith was living in such a way that only God could explain your supernatural existence. It was taking God at his word, not smoothing it off for the 21st century, but saying, I want everything that God has, I want to live it to the full. So when we think about the need of the hour, we think of people around us who are desperate for God, they don't know the Lord, the gospel work will not be accomplished by a few professionals. You can't pump people out of seminary fast enough to do this work. A hundred a year, two hundred a year, three hundred a year. But if, like the Lord Jesus did, each person took a handful of people and worked with them, and then as Paul said to Timothy, I'm committing it to you, you commit it to faithful men, they'll teach other also. You have geometric progression. That's how the church grew in the early days. Not by a handful of professionals, but by everyone laying down their lives for the brethren. That's where the real blessing comes. Not token blessing, but total blessing. Because that was the design the Lord Jesus gave us in the church. So I just leave these things with you. I'm not want to be argumentative. I'm not trying to be critical. But I'm asking us to enlarge our thoughts and say, Lord, obviously the church is lackadaisical, ho-hum, humdrum. We have lots of activity, but very little spiritual blessing. Very few people getting saved. They say that since the beginning of the church growth movement, there's hardly been a percentage difference in the population of the evangelical churches. Just shifting around, moving from smaller churches to bigger churches. We need to get back to God's original intention. And this was just a little exercise to try and think seriously about some of those conditions, some of those circumstances, some of those details. So God help us to uh, come before the Lord and say, Lord, do what you want to do with us. We just want you to get the glory.